Welcome to the Justice Committee's second meeting of 2019. There are no apologies. Agenda item one is our final evidence session on the Management of Offenders Bill. I refer members to paper one, which is note by a clerk, by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Humsav Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Graham Robertson, Team Leader, Sandra Wallace, Parole Policy Team Leader, Stephen Jackson, Solicitor, and Craig McGuffey, Solicitor with the Legal Services Directorate. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for um, the various submissions to the committee, and I believe you wish to make uh, a brief opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Convener. Thank you for inviting me this morning. Also, thank you for uh, the flexibility in being able to give this evidence session uh, this week as opposed to, 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 to last week. Um, you've already obviously heard from my predecessor in relation to the management of Offenders Bill. Uh, since then, as we know, the committee request is uh, understandably so an extension to stage one to allow them consideration of two independent reports on the operation of home detention curfew, which published on the 25th of October. And again, of course, I'd like to take this opportunity to put on the record uh, my condolences to the family uh, of, of Craig uh, McClelland. Uh, following the publication of the independent report uh, works, all 37 recommendations were accepted by the Scottish Government, the Scottish Prison Service uh, and Police Scotland. Work has been ongoing to ensure that all the recommendations are taken forward, some of which uh, may be by way uh, of this bill. And I'm open, of course, to feedback from the committee on that process. Uh, I'd like to briefly uh, restate for you the purposes and principles uh, of the three parts uh, of the bill. Part one of the bill is designed uh, to provide a single overarching set of rules uh, governing the use of electronic monitoring applicable across the breadth of the justice system, be that pre-conviction uh, at the point of sentence or indeed, of course, release uh, from imprisonment. Uh, as such, the provisions of the bill are intended to be read alongside those relating to the underlying orders which remain very much in force. These provisions support the more extensive, more consistent, more strategic use of electronic monitoring envisioned by the report of the Working Group on Electronic Monitoring in Scotland. Uh, part two of the bill is about the basic disclosure of convictions when someone wants to gain general employment, for example, in a shop or an office or, or when, they, when they apply for, for home insurance. We want to reform the general disclosure system uh, as the evidence is clear that a system that involves too much disclosure can have negative impact on people's lives. Uh, we propose to reduce the period of disclosure for the majority of sentences, bring more people within the scope of the protections under the 1974 Act and increase the clarity and accessibility of the legislation and improve the terminology used within the legislation to reduce any confusion about the purpose of disclosure. Uh, that le this legislation, uh, coupled with cultural change, will amount to progressive reform that will unlock the massive potential of people uh, with convictions and help reduce reoffending. Uh, and part three of the bill, uh, finally, uh, convener changes the term of appointment and reappointment of parole board members to bring them in line with other tribunals, uh, the intention being to maintain the expertise of members and build on their experience. It also removes the statutory requirement for there to be a psychiatrist and judicial member of the board, relying on the particular expertise of the wider membership to fill these gaps. Uh, the bill also reinforces the continued independence of the Pro Board in its decision making uh, and allows the Scottish Ministers to set out the Board's governance and, and uh, arrangements in secondary legislation. Uh, as you may be aware, on the 19th of December uh, last year, uh, the Government launched the consultation paper uh, Transforming Parole uh, in Scotland. That is part of our commitment to improve openness and transparency in the parole system. Uh, the, the consultation will also see, seek to, to seek people's views on how to strengthen the voice of victims and their families uh, as well. Uh, we're also consulting on supervision, review and recall arrangements for people released on parole and how to further enhance the independence of the report, report, uh, parole board. Uh, the consultation covers the issues uh, raised in, in Michelle's law proposal uh, as they relate to parole. Uh, if issues requiring legislative change are raised through that process, uh, of course, we will consider whether the bill can provide uh, an appropriate vehicle to take those forward. I'm happy to take questions. John Finney. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Cabinet Secretary, if someone is to be considered for transfer to the open estate within the Scottish Prison Service, that requires a, a, an assessment to be made by a multidisciplinary risk management team, whilst decisions in home detention curfew are made by a single individual. Is there, is there any conflict there, do you think? I mean, I understand the, the, the thread uh, of uh, John Finney's question. What I would say is, since the inspectorate's reports, which I reiterate all the recommendations uh, have been ex uh, accepted, 
there will be a more robust risk management assessment uh, and process. At the moment, the other partners, under the previous regime, in fact, other partners did feed in, such as criminal justice, social work. But clearly, the work of the, the working group that will take forward uh, the, these recommendations will look at that risk assessment, whether, they're, whether it should be multidisciplinary, uh, which other partners should be invited to give feedback. Um, what I would say in relation to the, the, the analogy that, uh, or the hypothetical that John Finney puts forward, uh, there is, of course, a difference between short-term prisoners and, and long-term prisoners, uh, and, and, and it may be that for uh, all of the, the resource and the time uh, required to put together a, a multidisciplinary team similar to, 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 to that that would assess somebody going into the open estate, uh, for somebody on a six-month sentence, for example, only serving half of that, and then going on to HDC, that, that might not be uh, entirely appropriate. But his general point uh, that John Finney makes, um, certainly the working group is looking at risk assessment, whether that can be done better, involve more partners, and how that can be improved. That was uh, uh, you know, one of, one of, certainly one of the, the, the recommendations uh, going forward. And, and the, thank you for that, Kevin. So the, the, the present situation with home uh, d detention um, curfew, the um, drop in 75%, that surely suggests there was something wrong with the previous system or there's a risk aversion on the part of the Scottish Prison Service. This is a valuable tool. I, for one, would like to see uh, as much use made of it as possible. It does suggest that there's a knee-jerk reaction and risk averse. Yeah, 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 yes, I think John Finney's correct. That, that, uh, you know, we absolutely live uh, in a world where um, organisations, be they private or indeed public, uh, when there is a lot of media scrutiny uh, on them, uh, there is almost a natural instinct to, to be, be risk averse. Um, my hope, because uh, I agree with John Finney, I do think HTC is a very useful tool for, for, for reintegration. Um, my hope is that it's a temporary risk aversion. Uh, that is quite a dramatic decline. In fact, I'm answering a, a question later on from, from Lee MacArthur in the, in, in the Parliament around a prison population and the increase uh, in that a 75% uh, reduction in HDC is undoubtedly contribute, will undoubtedly contribute. There's other factors too, but certainly contribute to, 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 to prison numbers. So my hope is that it's a, uh, it's a, it's a short term. My, my belief is that it will be uh, hopefully a short term uh, risk aversion. In terms of the previous regime, um, there's no doubt at all that when two inspectors come forward with a report with 37 recommendations, that there's clearly improvements that can be that can be made. It's important that we we learn those lessons. But it's also important to say that as a parliament, um, we have um, uh, collectively uh, agreed on, on on much when it comes to HTC and approved uh, various guidance and, and legislation previously. I, I would hope that whatever changes we can make, we can take um, the majority, if not all, of the parliament with us. Thank you. I know colleagues have had a number of questions. This one brief question, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, and that's, that's the role of G4S in this. Um, um, it's them that produce the statistics for the, the briefings that we have here. I just wonder the extent to which having a commercial organisation involved in the process when you have statutory bodies like Police Scotland, Criminal Justice, Social Work and the Scottish Prison Service involved, whether that's helpful <coughs> or whether it sh the, I mean, the entire uh, regime should rest within the public sector. As um, I would feel. Um, uh, you know, it didn't come up in, 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 in the reports uh, from the inspector as being uh, <laughs> one of the one of the uh, major issues uh, of, of, of concern. I've, I visited the G4S control centre myself, I have to say, to, to have a look uh, at the regime in a little bit more detail. And I was um, exceptionally pleased at the professionalism of, of the organisation and, and the people uh, working in that control centre and how diligently they did their job. So um, uh, at this stage... Uh, I wouldn't say that the commercial operation of it uh, gives me a uh, huge uh, concern. Okay, thank you very much. Lee MacArthur. <coughs> Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Morning. Just following on from John Finney's line of questioning, um, there was a suggestion there that this was uh, that the dramatic reduction in use of HDC was a reflection of ri uh, risk aversion within the Scottish Prison Service, but to some extent. Um, with the new presumptions against HTC, um, it, it's less about risk aversion and it's more about the more limited range of, of situations where HTC, or certainly the presumption um, that HTC may be uh, applicable. So uh, is there any likelihood of that changing for as long as those, um, th those restrictions on use of HTC? Um, yes, I think it's a very... I think it's a very fair point. I mean, we'd have to drill down 
further into the figures in relation to that 75% reduction. But I think all of us would, would be able to recognise more in the political field and, and ourselves under, uh, you know, media scrutiny. Uh, we've all been in a position, undoubtedly, whether it's ourselves individually or our political parties or other institutions we belong to, that when there is that level of scrutiny, there's almost an automatic uh, risk aversion. I think we could all, all, all recognise that. But not, notwithstanding that, um, the point Lee MacArthur makes, uh, I think, is absolutely correct. You know, we have... Um, limited the scope. It's important to say it's not a ban, it is a presumption against, but um, you know, a presumption against uh, those that have an index offence for violence, uh, carrying an offensive weapon, a bladed uh, article, uh, or indeed uh, links to, to serious organised uh, crime. That, that does undoubtedly range the scope, uh, limit the scope. It, it doesn't mean that the numbers of HTC it can't potentially increase in the future. We may not see them to the level we saw under the previous regime, before the presumptions were brought into place. But there is, I think, scope for HDC to increase, of course, with the legislation coming forward. If I take electronic monitoring in the round, not just the HDC, then we'd want to, I mean, the, the government's stated goal is to continue to, to see the expansion of electronic monitoring. And in fact, this committee has produced reports to, 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 to that effect around um, bail supervision and, 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 other, uh, and other parts of the criminal justice system. But uh, I take Lee MacArthur's uh, point, and it's something that we're looking at carefully. And, I mean, that's helpful. I mean, I, I'm struggling, though, to understand what will um, encourage those numbers to go back up, albeit to an appropriate level. And, and I think what we're struggling to understand is whether the, the, the previous level was um, exorbitantly high and the current level is, is um, uh, unsustainably low in terms of managing that process of, of reintegration of, of, of prisoners back into the, the community. Um, but it does seem to me to not only have an impact on the overall size of the prison population, but also increase the risk to communities from uh, the return of prisoners back into the community um, without really any opportunity um, to manage that process in the way that HTC has enabled um, uh, the process to be managed up until now. Yes, again, I think the, the both uh, fair points that Lee MacArthur makes, I mean, just try to address both of them. I, I, I will drill down into the figures in, in, in more detail, but my understanding uh, is that that, that 75% reduction um, is not necessarily all down to the presumption. Um, my belief is that there's an element there of, 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 of risk aversion, and, and there is some work obviously being done by the governors in terms of further guidance. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it may be that we see those numbers keep up, but he's right if there's a presumption there, which there is now very much in place, having accepted the inspectorate's recommendations, um, it would be, I think, difficult to see the numbers rise dramatically up to the point before the presumptions were in place. So I accept that point uh, utterly and, and, and fully. So therefore, when it comes, excuse me, to prison numbers um, and, and, and how we hopefully collectively uh, agree to, 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 to lower those prison numbers, uh, you know, HDC will be a part of that, but actually we'll have to look at other uh, options uh, as well. But I'll obviously address that later in, in, in parliamentary proceedings. His second point is also one that I, I fully agree with and, and, and gives me uh, cause for concern uh, as well. The, the, the evidence... Um, and there's been a number of, 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 of bits of research on HTC, the Ministry of Justice, for example, doing, doing pieces that I th found quite helpful, that um, HTC helps with the reintegration back into communities. If there's less people going through HTC, they are less involved in the reintegration process, does that cause potential uh, harm? There, there is a absolute potential for that. Um, that is why I've asked um, my Justice Analytical Services to give me more qualitative research into the effects, positive uh, effects, and indeed if there are negative but effects of uh, the home detention uh, curfew. I think that is hugely important. Um, when I was at G4S Control Centre, um, um, those uh, there told me about stories of how being on home detention curfew after a period of imprisonment um, allowed people to reconnect with their family um, and, and, and that in itself, some of the support that they then accessed voluntarily, that they accessed but they were guided to by, 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 by others, 
um, really helped in terms of their uh, reduction and, and desire to, to reoffend, I should say, uh, to desire not to reoffend. So um, I think there's absolutely uh, merit in what Lee MacArthur uh, says, and it's something we have to very seriously consider as a justice system. So from what you're, you're saying, I mean, look, we heard from the Risk Management Authority in, in earlier evidence, you said that the recent introduction of the presumptions against HTC has inadvertently or on purpose uh, raised the question of the purpose of HTC, its intention and what it's in place to achieve. But what you're saying is that Scottish Government's um, it, it intentions not to move away from, from HTC providing that, um, th th that ability to, to smooth the transition back into the, 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 the community. Um, is, that, is that a fair reflection of the government's position? Or? I think our position is that you know, we, we, we absolutely, uh, because of the research and evidence that exists, we think HDC can be a, a helpful tool for reintegration back into the community. In fact, I want to just bolster that with some additional qualitative research, and I'd be happy to, to of course, uh, to, to, to provide that to the committee once, once that is done. So I still believe it's a tool that can be helpful. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, when we look at the wider and bigger picture around prison population, reduction of uh, reducing reoffending recidivism uh, and trying to look at alternative disposals to custody, then uh, this is just one part of the puzzle to help us to, to achieve from, that. From what you're saying, it seems to chime with, again, evidence that we heard from um, previous witnesses about the need um, for, for these presumptions and, and, and this change to, uh, of approach to be reviewed I mean certain time frames were were, were offered up um, mm. but but certainly I think there was a feeling that um, this absolutely needs to be kept under review so that the the, the, the implications for mm. um, the the, uh, the process of reintroducing uh, ex prisoners back into the community um, is is assessed uh, on a qualitative basis do you have any can you make any commitment at this stage to a time frame for coming back to to Parliament, to this committee, uh, with that, uh, that assessment completed? Well, I read very carefully the, the, the evidence that had been given in previous sessions, uh, particularly the last two, pre uh, last two evidence sessions uh, on, on this particular issue. Uh, and I noticed that time frame, some ranging from three years to five years. Um, uh, I will look at that with we'll interest. No, no, I can't give you a commitment uh, right here, right now. I will wait for, for, of course, the stage one uh, report from, from committee and reflect on that. Uh, I do reflect on... HDC uh, quite a lot, and, and, and looking at the history of HDC, it's clear that it's an evolving, uh, you know, has, has evolved in terms of its structure, its governance, and of course, most recently, um, the, the, the inspector reports have provided 37 recommendations, which we which we all accept. So we always have to be open-minded to potential improvements or adjustments or evolutions of the HDC, uh, of, of HDC, uh, and as a government, we will continue to do that. But we do have to let the current regime embed in, most certainly, for a period of time before, I think, making any uh, fundamental changes to it. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> Morning. I think there's something that's been mentioned before, but I think some people will be concerned that there's a danger that public protection uh, could be compromised by this in order to promote rehabilitation uh, and reduce the prison population. Can you guide the committee on uh, what priority is public protection given? Uh, when assessing HDC uh, as against other considerations? How is the balance struck? I, I will answer that question uh, in, in just a second. What, what I would uh, encourage the member uh, not to do uh, is to necessarily say that it has to be a choice between uh, one or the other, between um, uh, public protection or indeed reducing reoffending behaviour within the perpetrator uh, or, or, or the offender. Um, because the two are uh, somewhat linked. I mean, uh, well, they are undoubtedly linked. Uh, if we can reduce reoffending uh, in an individual, then that clearly is of great benefit to victims, stroke potential victims. Uh, if we didn't, so it's just a, uh, it's just a, an important distinction or nuance, I think, to, to make. On his more substantial point, um, public protection is, is is absolutely key. Uh, it has to be the key consideration. There's a number of considerations protecting the public, protecting, uh, preventing reoffending and, and securing successful reintegration. Uh, it's clear from the inspectorate supports, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, frankly, uh, to paraphrase, didn't, didn't think there was enough weight uh, put on 
uh, the public protection uh, side of it, although to uh, acknowledge a key consideration. Uh, and therefore, uh, of course, uh, we have accepted, as I keep saying, the, the, the 37 recommendations between ourselves, SPS and, and Police Scotland. However, there's certainly more that we can do to, to understand how best to weigh those elements. Uh, and the Risk Management Authority are now working with SPS uh, to develop a risk assessment tool for short-term uh, prisoners. Um, but I do have to say, um, ultimately, even with the best risk assessment tools in, in, in the world, it can only take us so far in predicting how an individual will, will of course, uh, behave and what they're capable uh, of doing. I think once that work is done, um, to develop that risk assessment tool to help to weigh those elements, uh, it would be helpful, I think, if we shared that with the committee. Um, and, of course, uh, <coughs> be, be helpful to, 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 to hear your thoughts uh, on that. I, I was going to ask you about the risk assessment tool. Do you have any indication, briefly, Cabinet Secretary, on when that might be ready? I mean, they're working on that now, and, and my direction to, to all the partners involved has been that um, it should be done right as opposed to rush. So I haven't pushed them, I have to say, on, on, on a timescale. But they have got the direction, and they understand from the inspector it's very thorough reports that protecting the public is right at the top in terms of the key assessments that have to be made. Um, but understanding the weight uh, is going to be important. So, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a time scale that I could tell you definitively. Um, but uh, and, and, and my direction has been to, to get it right as opposed to, to get it rushed. One specific point, just be before we move on. Can you give any indication if it will be, if the committee will see these, um, this assessment and the risk assessment tool before we complete the bill as stage three. I would think that's fairly important. Uh, I mean, I, I can absolutely see the logic of, of, of why that would want to be the case. So uh, if you don't mind, I'll take that back to, to partners and um, press them on that uh, again without, if, if we can get it done that time, I can see the sensibility of doing that. So uh, let's see if we can we can try to, to aim for before stage three. That's helpful, Lee and Claire. Thank you, convener. Uh, slight change of, Topic, but can you elaborate, Cabinet Secretary, on what was the thinking behind tasking prison governors with taking decisions on HDC rather than giving the role to a multidisciplinary risk management team, as happens elsewhere in the system? And on reflection, does that remain uh, your preferred course of action? I mean, it goes back somewhat to the question that John Finney asked in, 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 in the beginning. It is important that others do feed in to the decision that's made. So currently, they do criminal justice, social work. Being one, uh, but certainly others uh, will feed in, and, and the work of the working group that is ongoing is to explore and examine who else can make a useful contribution uh, to some of that. Now, again, we have to be very realistic around this. If somebody has a particularly short sentence, um, it may be a first offence, uh, unlikely, but it may, may be a first offence. It may, may not be. There might not be as much background on 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 the individual. So there's only a limited amount an agency. Uh, could actually feed in. Um, so there may be a very limited, uh, and in fact, it might be costly to bring a multidisciplinary team when they've got nothing to add value to in, in certain cases. So all these things have to be absolutely um, weighed up. Uh, governors are highly trained. Uh, prison governors are highly trained. Uh, they have a great uh, amount of uh, expertise uh, in what they're doing. I have to say I have uh, real confidence uh, in governors being tasked with making the decision, but they will not make it in isolation. They will make it with others feeding in. Thank you. Shona. Just uh, taking that a little bit further in terms of the, <coughs> the risk assessment and management of risk, which is, I think you should have pointed out yourself, uh, you can never eliminate risk entirely. Um, and you've mentioned the, the working group. Is it the working group that are working on the risk assessment tool? Is it the same? Or are those two different? things? Um, so uh, the, the HTC Guidance and Governance Working Group <coughs> is considering how in, uh, additional information uh, that is available uh, is, is best weighted uh, in those assessments of risk. So it is the HTC Guidance and, and, and uh, work, uh, the HTC Guidance and Governance Working Group uh, that's doing that, but SPS and the Risk Management Authority um, are the ones that are working together to develop a formal risk assessment tool for short-term sentence Presumably prisoners. drawing from the exactly. experience of the working group. I indeed, guess these yeah. two pieces of work are interlinked if yes, the, in terms of the guidance. Uh, I think it would be helpful for those to be shared with the committee mm -hmm. because um, I guess in, in looking at what, what will that look like in practice and being able to understand 
what that will mean in terms of those who are then using that guidance to judge the, whether that level of risk is acceptable uh, or not. Can you say a little bit about the, the, the working group and are there a variety of interests in that working group? Um, are, for example, the, the views of the, of, of the public reflected in, in that working group? Are, you know, are they able to um, you know, have a, a voice within those, mm. uh, those deliberations? I guess I'm thinking about those who um, represent victims, for example. How will they um, be able to influence the work of mm. that working group? Well, my understanding is there are organisations uh, that, that have been feeding in uh, that represents uh, represent victims. I mean, in, in previous, uh, before before the inspectorate reports, uh, a lot of the work uh, that previous working groups have done in and around uh, this bill has included, for example, Scottish Women's Aid, who right. had obvious okay. interest uh, in some of this. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll maybe hand to Graham to give you a little bit more yeah, details, yeah, more, more involved in, in, in elements of the working group. Yeah, so <clears throat> in the first instance, there's a number of uh, justice partners involved in the working group. Um, so police, uh, prisons, um, criminal justice, social work, risk management authority. Um, given the nature of some of the discussions, because they're looking at things like intelligence information, that's a tighter group initially, but absolutely we would like to widen it out to um, wider partners, including um, certainly third sector and academics have also expressed interest in being part of that and our intention is to take the work out to them as well in the latter stages. So... <clears throat> I mean, uh, looking at that, the guidance that might emerge from um, from that working group, um, clearly we have, the, as you've identified earlier, the, the, the two elements of pres presumption against in certain cases, understandably. Um, and then we have, obviously, on the other hand, the recognition of the role that HDC plays to integrate someone back into society. So in terms of that person's history, um, would they be able to look at, for example, someone who might have a, a, an index offence for violence, but it's 20 years ago when they were perhaps a young person in a different place in their life compared to where they are now? How much discretion would they have? Because presumably a presumption is not absolute. So would that guidance give the scope to yeah. look at, you know, the length of time that that index offence occurred? Is, is that the kind of areas that the working group would, would look at? Or mm -hmm. is that an absolute, you know, yeah. if the index offence has a violent component to it? Yeah. And I, I think it's an important question to, to answer and to hopefully give you some, some clar clarification and reassurance uh, around, uh, although I'll ask my officials to elaborate, I mean, we do talk about the index offence mm -hmm. being for violence um, or, or for uh, carrying an offensive weapon or bladed article and links to serious organised crime if they can be established also. Um, but it is important that we, we mention it as the index offence yeah. as, uh, as opposed to, to, to looking at um, the, the, the past offences. All that being said, um, <coughs> one of, the, one of the, the measures we've taken forward uh, as a result of the inspector reports, as police intelligence mm. will now feed into a decision around home detention, curfew, uh, and police intelligence could be around, uh, again, links to, to serious organised crimes or indeed uh, any history that the police might have with individuals. But uh, we always have to be careful in, 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 in these areas. Uh, but again, I don't know if my officials want to add or elaborate uh, anything to that in particular. Uh, well, just as you said, the, the decisions are difficult decisions, they're complex. There's a lot of work going into making sure that richer information has gone into them. <coughs> Some of the inspector recommendations were that you know, longer term pieces of work look at um, what is done to, to correctly weigh those. So that's, that's the work that the working group are, are taking forward. Okay. Um, and that you gave a commitment that the committee would be kept informed of sure. the outcomes of the working group as it goes yeah. forward, yeah? For sure. 
Supplementary, Jenny, and then Daniel. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to the panel. Um, I'd just like to pick up on Shona Robinson's uh, point with regard to the working group and women's aid written submission uh, calls for criminal justice, social work and Scot the Scottish Prison Service personnel to receive training uh, on the dynamics of domestic abuse, particularly in light of the 2018 uh, Domestic Abuse Act. Um, so do you think then that HDC is problematic in terms of domestic abuse where reoffending and controlling behaviours you know, might be more difficult to monitor and to, to see, I suppose? You know, our, our engagement with, with Scottish Women's Aid and a number of others, but particularly Scottish Women's Aid, is so, so important in this field. Um, when we look at this bill as, in its entirety and we look at <clears throat> potentially extending electronic monitoring, monitoring using, for example, GPS uh, technology, you know, uh, there is completely an understandable concern from the likes of Scottish Women's Aid to say, well, you might be able to tell where that person is on Google Maps or whatever, but it doesn't mean they're not contacting the victim by telephone or social media or some other way. So, so you know, uh, we have we would have some either serious reservations to, to paraphrase, but also we would need to see the safeguards in place. So, absolutely, when it comes to 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 not just um, home detention curfew, but the wider electronic monitoring discussion, um, our partners like. Scottish Women's Aid are, are, are so important. In terms of the training aspect, I, I believe that in, in some regards to, to, to SPS, uh, they, they, they are, are well aware of um, the training needs of, of uh, the, the, their, their staff. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you from the top of my head uh, whether or not they receive specific training. Um, uh, and of course, with the new act, and uh, the Scottish Government is funding training for, for example, police officers and others. So I'd have to look into that specific aspect of it. But it's a good point to, for us to raise and uh, for you to raise and for us to take away and reflect on. Thank you. Can I just ask a, a brief uh, final question? Um, so the written uh, submission from Engender also uh, asked for further explanation in terms of the impact of electronic monitoring on, on women, which you alluded to there. And they cite evidence of electronic monitoring bringing with it a number of problems which negatively impact on mother-child relations. And also the fact that 74% of female prisoners, this was from a 2015 survey, um, had suffered from anxiety and depression. So again, I don't know if you can go into the specifics of the remit of the working group on this issue, but will they look specifically at female offenders in terms of monitoring risk? I think it's hugely important that, that they're doing, again, we'll, we'll feed that back. You, you, you've obviously put it on the record, but we'll, we'll, we'll feed that back. And we know from all the research, and, and there's been some really good research in terms of the, the female offending population in Scotland, that there are vastly different uh, complexities when it comes to, to those f the females in our, in, in our prison estate. Of course, we're taking forward, uh, I would say, a radically different way of doing things in terms of our custody, uh, community custody units, our CCUs, two of which have been uh, granted uh, permission in Dundee and uh, in Glasgow. Um, I think we're doing a lot of good things, but um, yeah, clearly, when it comes to this agenda, there are some additional nuances for the female population than there would be for, for the male population, and that should actually should absolutely be part of the consideration. If it's not, I will ensure that it, that it is. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one thing I've said to colleagues uh, re reflecting on, on where we've got to is that I think with hindsight, following the tragic case of Craig McClelland, when we were examining this bill, I think we overlooked a couple of key matters. One was, uh, you know, essentially we were looking at how electronic monitoring might be applied going forward using this bill. And we also looked at what would happen if a person breached following this bill. What we didn't ask was how those decisions were being arrived at currently and what happens right now when people breach those conditions. I was wondering if the, the Cabinet Secretary would uh, reflect that, that perhaps in bringing forward this bill there wasn't sufficient examination in terms of the assessment made and then how uh, uh, electronic monitoring was currently monitored with the existing legislation. Yeah, um, I appreciate the member's um, frank insight, but also his candour in, in, in terms of uh, his own uh, perspective on it and, and also the committee's perspective. I think it's helpful. Uh, I think from my own perspective, it's, it's somewhat difficult because you'll know, of course, I was in a different ministerial position when this bill was was, was, was making its progress and, and it came in uh, in June last year. So it's difficult for me to, to necessarily say what the considerations were of my predecessor or indeed the, 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 the bill team, but I think it would be fair to say that when we see a tragedy uh, like we witnessed um, with, with in the Craig McClellan case, there's, there's no doubt that it sharply focuses all of our minds and, and, and does of government. Um, the inspectorate reports coming forward 
collectively with 37 recommendations clearly means that the system could have uh, could be improved uh, from the previous regime and will be improved but clearly there was room for improvement there uh, in terms of, of 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 whether the risk management assessment was considered carefully enough uh, or not previous to that tragic incident um, it's difficult for me to say because, again, I was not in the position that I'm in. Uh, currently, what I can do is just give the member assurances that we are better for those inspectorate reports. And there is a lot of wisdom uh, in the committee having waited until those reports were completed uh, to re-examine uh, the evidence of, of, of stage one. Um, but I think we will all be better and the regime will be better and the public will be safer for those recommendations. I think the, 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 the Cabinet Secretary is absolutely right in terms of his emphasis on um, the, the, the safety element. We've already had a number of uh, committee members asking about uh, the risk management regime. And I do think that, that clearly that is central, uh, essentially uh, uh, enabling prisoners to have a degree of liberty uh, requires a robust risk management regime. Does the Cabinet Secretary think that that should actually be on the face of the bill, certainly in terms of clarity, in terms of the responsibility of who is responsible for arriving at that, that assessment, and more importantly, who is responsible for monitoring it once it's been made, given some of the comments that, that have been made both by HMI PS and HMI CS in their reports? So there's a couple of things I would say. I've come in front of this committee a few times, and on a number of occasions when looking at legislation, I've always been somewhat wary of putting too much on the face of a bill because of the rigidity involved in changing, uh, the difficulty involved in, in changing uh, uh, primary legislation. It's particularly rigid and, 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 and inflexible, whereas doing things through secondary legislation or indeed through guidance can, can keep you more flexible. And I suppose this goes back to Lee MacArthur's question around the need to be constantly reviewing and, and constantly and consistently uh, keeping an open mind to HDC as it may evolve over the years. And if we accept that we have to do that, and I, I do accept that, um, putting a risk management assessment procedure or risk management assessment tool on the face of primary legislation might create a degree of inflexibility uh, for the future. That, that wasn't what I was suggesting, Apologies. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, I think critically, in my view, what legislation should do is identify who is responsible um, and what they're responsible for. And I think the issue that I've got, when you look at the reports, and, and I'm going to, if you, if you, if you uh, just sort of give me a moment to... Uh, I just quote, so the HMIPS report stated that whilst an assessment process clearly existed, it may not be regarded to meet, uh, by some to meet the definition of robust. Likewise, another observation was that given that additional uh, HDC licence conditions were not monitored, it is doubtful that they served a purpose. But at the same time, when we heard from Colin McConnell, he was adamant that he was upholding uh, the guidelines uh, uh, and the... Uh, <coughs> The, um, the, 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 the the policy as, as, as stood before. So my concern is that if we've got a report saying that these conditions were not being monitored and yet we have the, the prison service saying that they were doing everything that they should and, and the bill doesn't identify in anything new in particular in terms of what is to be assessed and who is to do it and most importantly who is to monitor it my concern is that it's not going to be capable of um, satisfying these, uh, what I would believe are, are, are really very key issues identified by the two reports in terms of monitoring. So I agree that the tool shouldn't be on the face of the bill, but, but the high level uh, principles of what it should be doing and who's responsible for it should be surely. I apologise, I uh, misunderstood his uh, original question. Um, uh, in terms of uh, who should be um, I will look carefully, as I always do, but I will look carefully at the report that this committee produces in relation to stage one. Um, and I will try to be as much as I can, of course, uh, as open-minded as possible to suggestions that come forward from this committee, especially on this issue where I think, although we have differences on nuances between us all, 
ultimately we want to get to the same place where I think most of us believe, if not all of us, that HDC can play an important part, it can be an important tool within the criminal justice system. But appropriate safeguards for public confidence, public safety, of course, have to be there. And therefore, if there are sensible suggestions uh, around that, th then I will look at that. But in terms of who makes that decision potentially being on the face of the bill, I just go back to uh, my, my, my previous answer that um, on the face of the bill, um, we just always have to keep it in our mind, which I'm sure you do, but we always have to keep it in the front of our mind that if we do that, changing that can be incredibly difficult in a process that already has gone through some change in its, uh, in, its, uh, in its formative years. So we've already seen quite a bit of change around the regime over the years, in recent years. Um, we just have to be careful that we don't box ourselves into a corner. But all that, not, you know, notwithstanding all of that, um, you know, any suggestions that come forward, uh, I will keep an open mind on them. So just finally, Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I guess I, I think that the, the committee has an issue in that the, the central issues that have been identified by the reports in terms of the, the, the monitoring of, of conditions and information sharing, we don't really seem to have any key proposals in front of us to, to address those points. And I'm just wondering how you think that, you know, that, that we can uh, really uh, assess this uh, bill w without any additional proposals to address these key points? Quite a lot of work being done in relation to, to, to information sharing. In fact, we didn't have to wait for the inspectorate's reports for there to be an improvement in, in, in information sharing between, for example, SPS and, and Police Scotland in terms of uh, potential uh, breaches and, and, and people going unlawfully at large. In fact, there was quite a, a dramatic uh, reduction of those that went unlawfully at large once some of those information protocols uh, were, were improved. So uh, I could perhaps um, write to committee around some of the information sharing. I think it goes back to the convener's point around um, whether this can be done, uh, the work that's being done around um, the risk assessment can be concluded before stage three. Uh, I, I give an uh, undertaking to, to, to speak to partners around whether we think that is possible and to try to push them hard because uh, I can see the, the logic uh, and that and the sensible suggestion that that should try to be concluded before they see this bill. I don't know if it's possible or not, but I will certainly push them on that. <coughs> Convener. No apologies. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you'll know that the, um, the committee heard um, evidence that, uh, about a breach of an HDC following on from Daniel Johnson's uh, line of questioning uh, not being a specific offence. Could you um, elaborate or expand on uh, the Scottish Government thinking about making HDC uh, an offence and um, increasing police powers uh, of arrest when they suspect a person is in breach? Uh, if the members talk about kind of going unlawfully at large, then uh, one of the recommendations of the, the inspectorate reports was for government to give that consideration that would reflect somewhat the position in England uh, and Wales. Uh, and we know in the tragic case of uh, Craig McClelland that there was some discussion uh, and certainly some dubiety around whether or not um, there would be appropriate powers to enter a premises without unlawful at large being an offence. And there's, there's kind of varying different kind of legal um, thought on that. Uh, but what we'll reflect on and what we are reflecting on is at, at stage two potentially just um, removing that dubiety that might exist by making unlawfully at large uh, 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 an offence and, and therefore uh, giving uh, officers potentially the power to, to um, in, in, into premises. Um, so that's something we'll, we, we, we will consider. I said that at the time in my, my ministerial statement uh, in, in relation to the two inspectorate reports. Uh, I, I note from the evidence that you've taken from Police Scotland that there's calls for, from them to explore other areas uh, that potentially give police additional powers so on a suspected breach as opposed to a confirmed breach. And again, we'll look at the evidence very, very carefully. I would have, I have to say some concerns uh, that I would have to d d discuss uh, both with legal teams and also obviously with Police Scotland uh, and, uh, and others around that. Uh, but certainly we would look at um, look at all these suggestions and reflect on them. Rona. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, 
I'd like to sort of ask you what you think the wider implications of the, the two reports might be and whether they would um, have an, a bearing on the release of a prisoner due for parole um, or, of, or of an accused on bail. Um, so is that going to alter the, the process or the thinking behind someone who's due to come up for parole? Obviously, uh, as, as the member knows, uh, obviously all very different um, uh, processes. Um, parole at the moment, as I said in my opening statement, has a consultation ongoing uh, around it. Uh, this committee has made many suggestions around bail, which we'll look at uh, as well. There may be some kind of cross-cutting lessons to learn in around risk management in particular, um, and potentially, as, as some members have already alluded to, um, multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, but, um, you know, again, I looked at the evidence from, from the parole board. I think I had John Watt here. And, you know, again, he very much, I thought he was quite uh, direct in saying that actually, from his perspective, parole is a, is a separate uh, process. It is going through a consultation. Uh, and, and, and what has been learned from HTC wouldn't necessarily be applicable to parole. So, you know, where there may be some overlap, it might be limited. But, you know, we are always looking at bail, we are always looking at HDC, we are constant and electronic monitoring, and we are constantly looking at um, things like, like parole with the consultation underway at the moment. So it have, should have no significant bearing on that aspect, as, I, as you see it. I, I don't see it uh, currently uh, have, having any uh, major bearing. It could be, there could be some, some overlap, but uh, mm -hmm. as, the, as, as John Watt at the parole board said, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it would have a major, major impact. There is a separate consultation on parole, and that is important. Um, but we should always uh, make sure we're constantly reviewing the processes we have in place. But I don't think a major, major impact would be my assessment, certainly. Thank you. And can I ask you, just to clarify the position or the, the two reports might have on the government's plans for expanding electronic monitoring? I know you mentioned this mm -hmm. early on. If you could maybe just clarify whether or not there will be a will have any effect on the plans that are to mm -hmm. expand the... I think it's an important question. Maybe it, goes, it kind of goes back to the earlier questions from John Finney and, and, and Lee MacArthur around, um, you know, is, is, is there a risk aversion? And, and, and uh, what I hope was a, a frank answer from me that you, you'll get an element of that, I think, when you have uh, understandably high-profile cases. Uh, I, as, as the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, um, absolutely want us to make sure we have the appropriate safeguards, we, we, we learn the appropriate lessons and we accept the appropriate recommendations. But I have to say, as, as a government and as the Cabinet Secretary, I still see electronic monitoring as a really useful tool and a really important tool in the various uh, orders that they are used in. Uh, and therefore, the further use of it, the, expans the expansion of electronic monitoring is still absolutely the government's intention. And I suppose the risk assessment sort of... Um, re-evaluation and, and scrutiny will, will affect that as well in, in the sense that um, it, it will allow you to move forward um, with confidence yes. because that'll, it's all part of the risk assessment. Yes, for sure. Yeah. I, I think the safeguards are really, really important. I mean, uh, you know, a, a tragedy like the one that we witnessed uh, involving uh, Craig McClelland, uh, you know, it will also do a lot to, 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 I think, shake public confidence. And it's important that we do everything we can to restore that public confidence. I think we're, with the inspectorate reports, in, 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 a, in a good place. Um, and the work that's been done by the various working groups and indeed between partners will only help to strengthen that and hopefully uh, boost public confidence in this measure. OK, thank you. Um, before we move back to the new offence, Cabinet Secretary, just to confirm, will on the parole board, there'll be access to specialist psychiatric um, uh, experience or, or to access these people, particularly looking at what I thought was a very powerful submission. I wonder if you've looked at that from the Royal Coyle College of Psychiatrists in Scotland, who made, I think, quite a powerful submission 
on the level of their expertise, both in prison health care, psychiatric hospital, transfer from, um, and that kind of sec oh, a, a range of things, which I won't go into now. But it seemed to me a very compelling submission. Is that something that could be looked at in terms of the membership of the Pro Board in the same way as, while it might not be necessary for the judicial represent representation to be there all the time, it would be um, available as and when necessary? Would that be the same with the specialist psychiatric? Um, I, I have to say, I, I agree with, with you, Convener, that I found the evidence to be quite compelling um, and, and quite strong uh, evidence from society. Um, I suppose a couple of things I would say in, in relation to the potential uh, removal of the statutory requirement for a psychiatrist. Uh, I, I thought also the evidence from the parole board around this um, made, a, made a lot of sense. There was a lot of logic to it. I mean, there's two and a half thousand cases they consider that one psychiatrist can't possibly uh, look at every single one of those cases. But also the, the, the secondary point that they made around um, the fact that um, out of the pro board members, a number of them have experience with psychiatry, are, are experienced in, 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 in the field, and therefore, for them, the statutory requirement was, was was not needed. I think it was. I think it might have been yourself, convener. Though I, I should. Uh, I'm just recollecting recollecting from from memory, looking at the the evidence session that pushed them to say, well, that may be the case, but. You know uh, why remove the statutory? Why 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 leave it to chance? Almost as opposed to to have the statutory provision there, uh, and 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 uh, you know I can see the argument uh, that, that that is made by both sides. So on this particular clause, um, uh, again I'll await uh, your committee's report, but I have a a very open mind to looking at um, this particular issue again. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, again, on the new offence, moving back to Liam Kerr and Daniel. Yes, Commissioner, I just wanted to follow up uh, on the question from Fulton McGregor asked about the new offence. And, and the new offence is something that I, I, in broad terms, support, and I think in particular in terms of giving the, the police the, the ability to enter a premises when uh, a breach has occurred, which is one of the shortcomings. However, the, the, the Law Society has given us quite a, a detailed submission with some concerns and indeed uh, uh, um, areas where they, they feel that there may be shortcomings. Um, indeed, they, they uh, state that creating, a, and I quote, creating an offence will not address um, the issues around uh, information sharing um, other than uh, with a, a practical uh, effect where when caught that they fall to be sentenced to a further period of custody in addition to serving the remainder of their outstanding sentence. Given the concerns that they've set out, I was wondering whether uh, the, the, the Cabinet Secretary had a, had a view on how uh, the government was going to address the concerns that the Law Society has set out. So, um, you'll forgive me, I haven't seen the briefing, so I will undertake to look at the briefing uh, after this uh, committee session. I don't know if it's been sent on to me or, or not, but certainly I'll, I'll get a hold of it and uh, have a look at it in, in, in detail. What, we, what we'd be aiming to do uh, is creating that offence of, of unlawfully at large, uh, as I said, to, to, to Fulton, to remove the dubiety, the legal dubiety that, that exists. Um, you know, this would be, in, in essence, uh, mirroring the situation uh, south of the border. Um, the Law Society's concerns, as you've described uh, them uh, just now, I suppose would hold if you looked at it completely in isolation. But what we have is 37 recommendations, of which consideration of unlawfully at large being an offence simply being one of them. But information sharing, uh, as we have discussed for quite a, a fair session of this committee, information sharing is a critical key part of some of the recommendations moving forward. So that hopefully would address it. But again, I would have to look at the Law Society's briefing in, in detail uh, to be able to comment um, uh, fuller, uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, in more fuller terms. Okay. Anything further on that? Um, a supplementary from Fulton. Sorry, convener, I didn't quite catch you quick enough. It's a supplementary back to the, the convener's line of questioning on psychi uh, psychiatrists on the parole board. My uh, recollection from that uh, particular evidence session um, was that I, th I felt there was a there, there was a slight um, feeling that psychiatric involvement in the board would represent mental health involvement as a whole. And I wondered if you could comment, Cabinet Secretary, if there's not um, 
If there's no need for a psychiatrist on a particular panel, what the role of mental health officers uh, within the whole system uh, might be, and, and other mental health professionals might be yeah. in, in informing decisions. Well, it's, it's, it's really a topical uh, discussion because of the spill, of course, but also because of the pro consultation. So, um, you know, in my interactions with uh, the pro board, John Watt in particular, but also uh, other members of, of the pro board, um, the information that comes forward to them uh, is of real paramount importance, of course, as that is uh, largely, not exclusively, but largely you know, the information that is provided to them in their dossier uh, will help determine them to make a decision one way or another on, on, on a person's release on parole or not. Uh, and therefore, it's utterly critical that they are getting uh, the most comprehensive information possible. Now, uh, much of that, because we're, we're looking at uh, you know uh, the, the, those on on, on longer sentences. Um, th there is time to 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 gather that information, uh, which would include uh, information about the individual's mental health uh, as well. But clearly, what the consultation uh, part of the consultation uh, will, will will focus our, our minds on will be on how that information uh, can can be bettered. How can we get better information? to the parole board, um, what is their thinking around the other th other things that they need to consider that perhaps they're not getting information uh, to the fullest extent uh, at the moment. So um, it's very topical and, and very much a part of the current considerations. Governor Secretary, you said you haven't looked at the Law Society submission, but it is a very powerful submission and raises a lot of technical points, which I think the committee haven't taken evidence on and weren't aware of, particularly the effect of notification of the, 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 the breach, um, the recall notice, um, just the, the priority system for priority categories of, of cases. All of this, and um, coupled with the no monitoring compliance um, of additional conditions to address for specific um, concerns and identified risk, all raised with us, I think, at the WISE group when the committee went to visit them. And their conclusion was totally supportive of the electronic monitoring and the extension of it. But without the adequate resourcing of the monitoring, the GPS, the new technology, then it's more or less doomed to fail. Can you give them some reassurance in that aspect? Well, I mean, I would tend to agree with the broad thrust of, of that, that it, the resourcing uh, of that, and therefore, uh, of course, the, the, the financial memorandum, the, the, the resourcing and the budget will be hugely, hugely important to that. And it goes back to a wider point, even, that we will discuss in Parliament uh, again later, the topical question around um, prison numbers. Uh, you know, the WISE group do some phenomenal work when it comes to the rehabilitation of uh, offenders and, and re reducing reoffending. Uh, and therefore, we have to be able to have across the country, um, I think, a more consistent approach to, to, to how we reduce reoffending to community payback orders. And all of that requires um, funding, of course, it does, and we'll continue to invest uh, in that. Um, and, and, and I think uh, it's a valid point that if we want to, you know, even if I look at our plans for, for presumption against short sentences of, of, of 12 months, now of course that will go through a parliamentary discussion, but if, if, if that passes, which I'm hopeful uh, of it passing, uh, then in, in that light, clearly we're going to have to ensure that there's funding available uh, to take forward those initiatives, uh, which we've already uh, budgeted for, um, but clearly for future years as that accumulates, uh, we'll have to, 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 to make sure that those organisations, local authorities and others are, are adequately resourced. I, I suppose just on that point, before I bring John Finney in for a, a supplementary, if, um, if there's a satisfaction public safety isn't an issue, then clearly rehabilitation using this uh, legislation to do that um, is, is where we would be going with that. That helps um, make sure that those prisoners who are not subject to the early release or early release and monitoring have more access to rehabilitation. And what we heard very clearly in our evidence when we first took it, the evidence was there are so many remand prisoners there that shouldn't be on remand and electronic monitoring um, would seem to have been the most sensible 
um, not high risk to the same extent as, as maybe looking at people who are already convicted and um, there, there may be a greater risk. Uh, and given that, do you think there's been an opportunity lost that this um, bill doesn't cover remand? I wouldn't say an opportunity uh, lost. Uh, you know, I, I read the uh, Justice Committee's report uh, on remand and, of course, subsequent uh, debate and discussion, uh, you know, very carefully. I mean, there, there are always different considerations for the use of electronic monitoring in different circumstances. So in HDC, for example, where the protection of the public would be the primary concern, uh, when it comes to, 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 to bail supervision, for example, uh, it would be the probability or not of the person appearing or not a non-appearance. That would be the risk that would potentially be weighed up. So it's, it's, it, there can be different considerations for for different applications of electronic monitoring depending on the type of, 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 of order. Um, but, uh, you know, I can give a, a real assurance to the convener that... Um, looking at remand, uh, we're continuing to look at remand, but very much focused on a number of the recommendations made by the, the Justice Committee in this front. John Finney, then Daniel. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. It's, it's perhaps more a point of clarification than, uh, than necessarily a, a question that relates to your comments about the Law Society evidence and the fact that the Cabinet Secretary, the most recent evidence from the Law Society, is unsighted in that. And I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, you said you would look at it, if there's a possibility that you could respond to, because it is quite detailed, within a time frame within which we could therefore consider it as part of our Stage 1 report. Um, rather than because this will be printed uh, yeah. on our website, presumably, and it would be good to just round that bit off so that we could consider factors. Especially uh, as we have taken the evidence on it, Catherine. Uh, exactly. Well, I thank John Finney for giving me more bedtime reading uh, <laughs> to do, but uh, to add to my accumulation of papers that I have every night. But uh, from everything that members are saying, it's an important briefing, so <clears throat> I don't see why, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't look at that Law Society briefing uh, relatively quickly and, and uh, try to give you a quick turnaround uh, on that. On that. I, I'm not, uh, though my officials will have this information, I'm not quite sure of your stage one timetable for your report, but I will double check that and try to give you as quickly as I possibly can. But, yes. Um, yes, the clerks can send you that briefing and I think there's liaison with the officials on the stage one um, timetable and a definitive date. And Daniel. I'd just like to thank the committee for raising our, our inquiry into remand, and I think there are some relevant points here. One is about recording the reasons why bail, bail is uh, refused, and there, there was some pushback when we, we raised that as to whether or not that would be useful. However, given the evidence that we've taken from, amongst others, uh, Social Work Scotland about social, criminal justice social workers finding it useful to have um, the assessments made by courts in terms of their work, and I think given the, 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 the relevance in terms of public safety, in terms of making risk assessments, if a court has decided that someone uh, shouldn't be granted bail for, for public safety reasons, I think it, it stands to reason that is a, a useful bit of information if people are conducting a risk assessment, assessing someone for HDC. I was just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary thinks that uh, for those reasons that, that having the assessment made by the court regarding a refusal of bail <coughs> might be useful and, and could form part of a risk assessment for, for electronic monitoring in HTC. Mm. Let, me, let me look at the issue again as, as the assurance I can give the member. As I said, they, they, they are, there can be different reasons for, for, for bail uh, be, being refused, as he knows and, 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 and alludes to. It could be for public safety. It could equally be, as I said before, for risk of, of non-appearance uh, in, 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 in the future. And therefore, uh, perhaps that information being shared, even if it is shared to limited partners, might be of use. So I, I can certainly see the... The thread of, 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 of his logic and his, 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 his argument. So, uh, again, uh, I'm happy to look uh, at this issue uh, again. Thank you. There's just one final niche point which was raised with us at the, the WISE group, and that's very often when they're trying to follow up um, if there has been a breach and perhaps someone is in the hospital, they try to make inquiries. The police sometimes try to make inquiries, and they're told that um, the, they're not able to be provided with this information because of data protection. Obviously, there's a misunderstanding, I think, here somewhere about um, the data protection. Is that something the Cabinet Secretary can... 
can take on board? Uh, I will certainly look at it. It's not been raised with me uh, directly, and I, I don't think I saw it in your evidence sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly from the transcripts that I read, uh, but uh, I'd be more than happy. Uh, I mean, I, I hold the, the Wise Group in the highest esteem, knowing their work for a number of years. So, uh, if they are suggesting that it uh, is an issue that they've come across, then I have no reason to doubt that. So, um, uh, I, I'd be happy to look into that and, and make direct contact with the, the Wise Group. But I have often, <coughs> like many others, I think, around this table, have been bewildered at um, how sometimes the most basic information is, 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 is not shared, uh, which could make a massive difference to the processes that we do. So um, if we can nip this one in the bud, then I'd be happy to do so. Clerks can, can send you the, the, the evidence, and I think the police confirmed that when we took evidence okay. too, so we're happy to supply that information. That concludes our evidence. Can I thank the Captain Secretary and his facial also very much for attending. We now... Um, we will move into private session and um, our, our next meeting will be on the 22nd of January 2019, where we'll be seeking to finalise two Stage 1 reports. We now move into private session and suspend briefly to allow the public gallery to clear. <laughs>